Today, I'd like to take a look at the Greek Dark Ages, which is the period in Greek history between approximately 1100 and 800 BCE. Some scholars would start a little bit earlier and say 1200, and others would end a little later, say around 750, but I think that 1100 to 800 is pretty much sort of the consensus when it comes to the years of the Greek Dark Ages. So in this video, I want to establish what the Greek Dark Ages are, I want to establish a context for them, and I want to talk about a few of the controversies that are ongoing when it comes to uh, what people talk about when they debate this time period. So let's dig right in. So how did we get to this Dark Age in the first place? Well, to understand that, we need to rewind to my last video on the Mycenaeans and talk about the Bronze Age collapse. So around 1100 or so, the late Bronze Age world as a whole came unglued, and all of the civilizations of the Near East contracted and declined. The New Kingdom period in Egypt, for instance, ended and was followed by a time when it was rare for a pharaoh to control all of Egypt, and even when one pharaoh was able to pull that off, they rarely had enough power to project force beyond their own borders. And it was similar throughout the entire um, Mediterranean and Mesopotamian regions. Now, um, the thing is, this is called a collapse, but for most of these civilizations it was not a collapse. Assyria, Egypt, and Babylon were all still around at the end of the uh, Bronze Age collapse and the period which corresponds with the Greek Dark Age. The only real collapse during this period was actually in Mycenaean Greece. And because Western scholars focus so heavily on Greek civilization and the sort of intellectual genealogy of the West, they tend to date and name things after events that are the most Western. Therefore, it's the Bronze Age collapse simply because the Mycenaeans collapsed. And this collapse took the form of all of the major palace sites being destroyed and abandoned. Um, now, there was one theory that was prominent at one time that there was a mass scale invasion by sea peoples that has been heavily challenged. And there's also another outdated theory that there was a class centered uprising. And this was something that was popular among Marxist historians at one point. Uh, although I don't know of anyone who thinks that that was the case now. Um, it's also possible that these centers were more or less not uh, kept up and rebuilt because ecologically Greece was not producing enough wealth to maintain a um, non-productive palace site and that without the international trade work uh, trade networks working at full steam there just wasn't enough activity to justify um, fairly organized palace states. Anyway, I'm more on the side of just the simple lack of ecological and economic activity was enough to bring down the Mycenaean civilization and keep it down. But I don't really know, and the reason why I don't know and why no one knows is because the amount of evidence for this collapse is fairly limited and we can't really say too much definitively. A dark age is simply a period of time during which we don't have literary sources that can illuminate what is going on in the world. And actually the Greek Dark Ages are considerably darker than the better known medieval Dark Ages. Um, even when we look at an area like Britain around 500 to 1000 CE, we know a lot more about the people, places, and events from that time period than we do from Greece from 1100 to 800 BCE. Um, and actually it's not even close in terms of how much we know about each period. Um, now what we can figure out about the Greek Dark Ages we can figure out from the evidence that we get from archaeology. And the things that we can see that are fairly hard to dispute are that there's considerable population decline since there are several sites where we see a lot less activity than we had seen before but there's still evidence of habitation and at other sites we see that um, places are simply abandoned for centuries and only reoccupied later after we're into the archaic period. Um, and because there's so little evidence to work with, that means that scholars engage in a great deal of speculation, 
and that some of the theories about different controversies in the Dark Ages will vary pretty radically if you look into the scholarship. Here is a, um, an artifact from Lefkendi. This is a centaur, and this would have been made around, say, 950 or so BCE. Um, Left Candy is very important because it's the only fully intact Dark Age site that has been completely excavated at this current juncture. There have been a few other sites that have been discovered in recent years, but archaeologists are still getting around to looking at their findings and trying to learn more about this period. There's one scholar um, who said something to the, uh, the effect of, the people living in the Greek Dark Ages weren't in the dark, we are. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. It could turn out that most of what we know about the Greek Dark Ages, or think we know at this juncture, is actually wrong. But what I'm going to tell you is what we think is correct based on the evidence currently available. If, for whatever reason, you were forced to boil down the Greek Dark Ages to a simple binary contrast, that contrast would be between continuity and discontinuity. What we see, to sum it up, is that Greek culture language and religion all continue, but the Greek political system that had existed in the Bronze Age, i.e. the Mycenaean palace states, was completely lost along with other features of that um, administrative system such as Linear B. So the palace centers themselves, as I said, are now defunct and they will never return, but most of the sites will remain occupied or be reoccupied at some point during or after the Dark Ages. While Linear B was lost, and we know that Linear B was Greek, the Greek language did remain and would eventually return in the form of alphabetic Greek pictured on your screen. We also know that the old Mycenaean palace title of Basileus evolved from being a palace official to being a king. The reasons for that evolution are far from clear, of course, the um, sort of Marxist uprising scholars would probably say something to the effect that this is evidence that there was some sort of uh, uprising and that this was a sort of legacy title that took on greater meaning as time passed, but who knows? It's really hard to say how words change meaning when we don't have a set literary record which shows the evolution over time. We know that the gods remained largely the same. It looks like there were some different, some changes in the relative status of a lot of these gods, but that's something that we've seen before. Um, if you look at ancient Egypt, the goddess Isis changed her relative role many times from, say, the pre-dynastic period down to the late period, uh, which would have been approximately um, contemporary with the Greek Dark Ages and Archaic period. And that's only to be expected. Of course, stories change. Um, religion tends to be adapted to the needs of people living at a particular time, and as those needs change, so do the characters and the religion. Um, just like, you know, modern stories such as uh, superhero uh, mythologies change depending on the mood of the time. Batman became darker, for instance. Anyhow, um, what we see is that in material culture there's considerable continuity um, in terms of the way that burials are performed and all of that kind of stuff. But the quality of crafts and, um, say, pottery making, stuff like that, drops off pretty dramatically, which is indicative of a major decline in wealth. We also see that while the trade volume seems to have declined dramatically, Yubawea and other sites do demonstrate continued trade and contact with the um, east, especially with the coast of the Levant, what is now, say, Lebanon and Palestine, what was then the Phoenician world. In the scholarly literature on the Greek Dark Ages, no topic has been more discussed than the Dorian invasion. In Greek literature, the sources record that there was a major invasion by the Dorians around the time of the grandsons of Agamemnon and the generation of the Trojan War. So approximately, I believe they say 80 years after the events of the Trojan Wars, this occurs. And the location of these Dorian invaders is supposed to be somewhere approximately in the vicinity of Thessaly. 
Now, the problem with this invasion is that we see no major archaeological changes. There seem to be no changes in the material culture, and it seems like if this invasion did indeed happen, that it resulted in basically no changes, which is kind of weird if the Dorians are supposed to be a separate people, as the Greeks seemed to think at the time. Now, what this could be, as some scholars now think, it could just be a myth that was constructed later to try to explain the linguistic unity of many mainland Greeks who otherwise didn't really have any obvious links to one another. Uh, to sum it up, there are a lot of theories about what this could have been, but very little evidence. And a lot of scholars think that the Dorian invasion was a pure invention of later times. And I'm of that mindset, but again, with so little evidence to go on, that's not something I would bet more than about a nickel on. Until the Dark Age site at Left Candy was excavated, a lot of scholars believed that there was nothing more than a bunch of mud huts during the Greek Dark Age. However, the findings at Left Candy have changed our perception of the period pretty considerably, and it's very likely that any future sites in other parts of Greece would alter our understanding even more. So at Left Candy, we do find a grave from the dead middle of the Dark Ages in about 950 BCE or so, and this shows that there was a man who was cremated, which was not the practice of the Mycenaeans, and he was buried along with a woman who was not cremated, and she seems to be buried in a garment which some archaeologists think was a thousand years old by the time that she was buried in it, and that it came originally from Babylonia, which either implies that it was some sort of heirloom from a previous time when trade was done at a higher volume, or else that this trade was still going on in this period, including in some really rarefied luxuries. Now, there's been a lot of speculation about why he was cremated and she wasn't. I won't go into that. All of that, as I said, is also speculation. Now, this kind of grave is called a heroine or a hero's grave. These are somewhat similar in conception to what the Mycenaeans were doing. Perhaps more interesting than this grave, though, is a, the remains of a 50-meter-long building, which was presumably some kind of successor to a Mycenaean palace or maybe just a different style of community center. Maybe it was some major uh, figure's house, like a chieftain's residence, or perhaps it was a shared living facility for an entire community. Based on the limited remains that we found, it's pretty hard to say. However, it does show that despite the relative poverty and low population of this period, large-scale building was still something that was possible. In the absence of great sites like Left Candy, another way that scholars can trace the development of Greek culture during the Dark Ages is by looking at the evolution of pottery in the same period. So, the first major pottery style to evolve during the Dark Ages after the Mycenaean collapse is called Proto-Geometric, and this is characterized by the use of basic geometric designs. Um, and as the name implies, these designs become more and more complex as time goes on. Um, the first object that you see there is from one of the centaurs found at Left Kendi. That would be from about 950. And the vase beside it is a proto-geometric vase from Athens at around the same time. You see that it's pretty basic. There's not a lot of decoration compared with classical pottery, certainly. And the geometric period is dated from about 900 down to 700. And the example on the far right is from actually uh, the early archaic that would be dated to about 750 or so. And you can see that there's a lot going on here. There are a lot of lines and strata of detail, and in the middle, there are actually human figures moving around. Now, these are not rendered in the same realistic uh, and lifelike way that later classical Greek art would depict humans, or Hellenistic art for that matter, uh, which got movement down pretty well. But we are seeing an increasing ambition in the potters. They're increasingly trying to depict more and more stuff. And that shows that people are putting a lot of stock into uh, 
making pottery. They're putting a lot of effort into it. Maybe it has greater significance. They want to tell their stories. Um, they want to convey meaning and tell um, and uh, possibly some of these pots are for ceremonial use. They're supposed to be at parties or they're supposed to be great trading items between major aristocrats. So as these things grow in complexity, that's also evidence of increased trade and competition, not to mention things like um, attempts to share stories and to transmit cultural information through the visual medium. One day, perhaps, we'll find enough sites like Left Candy that we can construct a compelling picture of what Dark Age Greece was actually like. But until then, more or less, what we know is that it was a time period which came between a much better archaeologically attested Mycenaean period and a much better attested archaic and classical period. And a lot of times what we're left doing is trying to read back into the Dark Ages based on what we know of earlier and later periods, meaning that we're guessing. Although these are educated guesses, a guess ultimately has its limitations. What we do know for certain, though, is that by the time that the Greeks emerged from the Dark Age, they had accomplished some fairly important things. One is that they had adopted the Phoenician alphabet by about 800. We know that the earliest fragments of Greek writing which appear on pottery date to about the year 800, even maybe a little bit before or a little bit after. Um, and it's pretty clear that this writing would have been contemporary with the making of the pots, or at least that seems to be the thought. It's also possible it was a little later, but it seems to have started cropping up um, in increasingly large quantities starting at 800. Um, we also see evidence that the um, what later evolves into the polis is beginning to emerge starting in the late 9th century, so again as we're approaching the year 800. And we can see that um, that is happening because urban centers are becoming more populated and they're showing greater signs of economic diversity. We also know that at some point toward the end of the Dark Age, Greek settlers began to arrive on Cyprus and eventually would become the dominant ethnicity in the area. And likely there's a pretty strong link between the Greek settlement on Cyprus and the adoption of the Phoenician alphabet since Cyprus was a Phoenician center before the Greeks arrived. And we also suspect that the Greeks learned quite a bit about shipbuilding and exploration from the same Phoenicians because a little later, around 750 or so, we'll see that Greeks would begin to colonize the Western Mediterranean in large numbers and also launch colonies in the Black Sea region, the north coast of Africa, and many other regions. The, most, the biggest achievement, though, I would have to say, is that the Greeks were able to get a more or less fresh start after having the slate wiped clean. They lost all precise knowledge of their own Mycenaean past. Later Greek historians would have no idea that there was any major discontinuity between the time of Achilles and themselves. They would think of all of history as being one unbroken timeline. They had no conception of there being a late Bronze Age collapse or anything of that kind. They had no conception of there having once been a Linear B script. Um, and all of these things were only rediscovered by modern archaeology. Um, early classicists didn't know that there was a break because they relied on texts written by Greeks who were also unaware of that. So, anyway, that is the Greek Dark Ages and that should serve as a good setup to talk about the Archaic Greek period, which is something that also has some limitations in terms of evidence, but which sees a lot more exciting things happen.